welcome to our devotion uh, at the start of this new week and we're going to continue where we left off on Friday looking at this incredible passage in 2 Corinthians 12 where we uh, are uh, told of this vision uh, whatever it was that Peter uh, rather Paul experienced in going up to the third heaven and we then looked at the thorn that was uh, in his flesh that God had afflicted him with and we said that we would explore what that really meant and perhaps from the outset let's just say that Jewish rabbis were accustomed to speaking about themselves in the third person and and Paul kind of takes that approach as he shares his experience with those in Corinth and so wonderful was this experience whatever it was that Paul wasn't even sure whether God had taken him bodily to heaven or whether his spirit had left his body. But what we can certainly conclude from Paul's words is the reality of heaven and the ability for God to take us there. The third heaven is the same uh, as the paradise that is mentioned a little later, the heaven of heavens where God dwells in glory. The amazing thing is that Paul had kept quiet about this experience for 14 years, during which time he seemed to have been kind of buffeted by this thorn in the flesh. And perhaps there were those who, like uh, Job's sorry comforters, who told him that this affliction of his was a punishment from God. Some of Paul's friends may have tried to encourage him by saying, okay, you know, don't worry, Paul, you know, uh, you got to get to heaven soon enough. And Paul might have replied, well, I've already been there, and that's why I have this thorn in the flesh. Uh, so God honored Paul by, by granting him visions and revelations, by taking him to heaven. But he honored him further by permitting him to hear these inexpressible words that we read about while he was in heaven. Now, whatever these were, we don't really know. They were not the words spoken by men. And there's no doubt that this vision of God's glory was more than uh, that it, this, or rather this vision was something that must have really uh, kind of sustained Paul in his ministry uh, as he continued to labor facing the fiercest of uh, opposition and so on. And that is our encouragement too. Uh, we may not uh, have a vision of heaven, but we know certainly that we are seated uh, with Christ in the heavenly places, according to Paul's very words in Ephesians 2.6. And we have this position of authority and victory far above all, Ephesians 2. And while we have not seen God's glory as Paul did, we share God's glory now, according to what Jesus said in John 17.22, when he says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. One day we will enter into heaven and behold the glory of Christ, according to John 17, 24. And if, you know, I had had an experience like this, I'm not sure that I would have been able to keep it quiet for 14 years. And had I shared it, I might have become instantly famous. But not so with Paul. Even now, when he's sharing it, he had not become proud. He simply told it as it was. He just tells the truth. Uh, it was not empty boasting in any way. The facts spoke for themselves. His great concern was that n nobody rob God of the glory and, and give it to Paul. He wanted others to have an honest estimate of him and his work. And so how could Paul have such a great experience and, and still remain so humble? And because of the second experience, that God brought into his life. And this is what we want to look at now. The Lord knows how to kind of balance our lives. If we have our blessings, uh, we may become proud. And so he permits us to have burdens as well. And Paul's great experience in heaven could have undermined his ministry here on earth. And so God in his, his goodness and in his, in his graciousness permitted Satan to buffet Paul in order to keep him from being proud and we've spoken about the predicaments of human suffering and how we are not able to fully answer all the questions around suffering this side of eternity 
sometimes we suffer simply because we're human. I mean, as you get older, you become more susceptible to, to things going wrong with various parts of your body. You know that the same body that can bring us pleasure can also bring us pain. The same family members and friends that bring us joy can also disappoint us. Sometimes we suffer through our own doing. We could give so many examples of this, and we tackled this during our, our um, during the Passion Week. Other times, it's because of our disobedience and rebellion, just as Israel suffered because of their rebellion against God in the wilderness, and refused to abide by His word. In those instances, God, in His mercy, may choose to humble us through affliction. And whilst, as I've said many times before, in His grace, God forgives our sins. But more than often, we, we suffer still the consequences of our sin. In other words, God permits us to reap what we sow. And we know too that hardship and suffering can be used by God to build godly character. Paul says that in Romans 5, of course. And when you walk along the, when you walk along the coast, um, you often find sort of rounded and polished stones in places where the the waves are constantly washing over them and beating against them. Uh, but if you go into some of the coves where, where the, the waves are not crashing upon the rocks, you'll find the rocks to be quite sharp and, and not rounded. And I think in the same way, God can use the waves of a, affliction and, and, and hardship and, and sorrow to round us off, to kind of polish us, as it were, if, if we let him. Paul says that this thorn in the flesh that he he was afflicted with was there to keep him humble. Um, you know, when you think about it, amazing spiritual experiences like going to heaven and back, you know, have a way of inflating the human ego. And we may not go to heaven and back, but we also have these amazing spiritual highs. And, and sometimes... As we mentioned early on, God's got to kind of balance the blessings with the burdens to to just keep us kind of grounded, um, to keep us away from from pride, uh, because we are so tempted to to sin when we are when we are filled with pride. Uh, had Paul's heart been filled with pride, those next fourteen years would have been filled probably with failure rather than success. And so we don't know what this, this thorn is. There's so much conjecture as to what the, the thorn was. The word thorn means a sharp stake used for torturing or impaling someone. Uh, so that's a pretty horrific kind of description. It's a stake used for torturing or impaling someone. It was a physical affliction of some kind that brought pain and, and distress into Paul's life. And as I say, we don't have to speculate as to what it is. Perhaps it's a good thing that we don't know exactly what it is. And the Bible doesn't tell us because in a way we can now apply this, this verse or this passage to any situation we find ourselves in. But what a contrast between Paul's experiences. Um, Paul goes off to paradise and then he moves to pain from glory to suffering. He tasted the blessing of God in heaven and then felt the buffeting of Satan on earth. He went from ecstasy to agony, and yet the two experiences belong together. His one experience of glory prepared him for the constant experience of affliction, for he knew that God was able to, to meet his need. And so what we need to look at is how did Paul respond to this thorn? And that's really the key of this whole passage. And hopefully it will teach us how we can respond when we sense that God is saying no, or we find ourselves in a difficult place and we, we, we pray and pray and God doesn't seem to answer. And so we're going to be exploring this more as we move through uh, these verses in the next few days. But for now, let's bow in a moment of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We just thank you for the encouragement your scriptures give to us. We thank you again for this experience that Paul had and how you bring balance into our lives. And even though we have blessings, we sometimes have burdens and sometimes we, we have affliction that keeps us grounded, keeps us 
kind of rooted in your word and looking up at you. And so we pray that you just continue to speak into our hearts, to draw us ever closer to yourself, and that we too would know that your grace is sufficient for us. And as we get into this in the next few days, may we truly understand what that that really means. And so bless us into this day. Uh, we just commit this week to you, whatever was in store for us. We just pray that we might just give you glory in everything that we do. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. And um, yeah, well, we all have a good week. I uh, just heard about an hour ago that I'm uh, a grandfather for the second time. So that's really good news. And uh, hopefully we'll get some pics coming through in the short while to see what this little bambino looks like. But uh, yeah, bless you all and have a... Uh, a great week ahead.